SQL allows the elimination of duplicate rows from the result using the distinct keyword. An important difference between SQL and the pure relational model is that duplicate rows have to be explicitly eliminated in SQL. So for instance, imagine that we want to have the category and the number of all the exercises that have been solved by at least one student. So we can get this information from the results table. And we simply have to select the category and the number from the results table. However, there are of course exercises that have been solved by multiple students. For example, the exam has been taken by three different students. So if you use this query, then exam one will occur three times in the result. And we might want to eliminate these duplicates. We are only interested that exam one has been solved by some student. We do not care about the duplicates. SQL allows to eliminate the duplicates by adding the distinct modifier. So we write the distinct after the select and thereby all the duplicates or the duplicate rows from the result will be eliminated by SQL. So then we get a table where every row appears only once. So we have once exam one, homework one and homework two. However, if you formulate an SQL query and you get unexpectedly duplicate rows in the result, then you should take this seriously. You should not simply add a distinct modifier to eliminate them. Unexpected duplicate rows are often a sign of a mistake. For instance, a missing join condition. So you should investigate and understand why you get these duplicates. And only when you understand why you get these duplicates and this is fine, then you can eliminate them. You should only use the distinct modifier if it's really necessary. An unnecessary distinct may slow down your query. Here we have an algorithm that helps us determine whether distinct is superfluous. This algorithm is based on the assumption that our where clause is a conjunction. The idea behind this algorithm is as follows. We, are, we want to show that every output row can occur only once, then the distinct is superfluous. So we start from the output row and we try to trace this output row back to the possible combination of input rows that have led to this output row. And if we can show that there is a unique combination of input rows, then the output row can appear at most once in the output. So we start by tracing the output row backwards. So we start with what is uniquely determined by the output row. And the set of attributes that's uniquely determined by the output row is of course all the attributes that appear in the output row. So that's, this, that's the attributes that appear in the select clause. So we start with a set K that contains all the attributes in the select clause. All those are uniquely determined by the output row. Next, we're going to extend the set of attributes K. We're going to look, our where clause is a conjunction. So that if there is a conjunct in this uh, conjunction that says an attribute A is equal to a constant, then of course also this attribute A is uniquely determined. So then we add A to our set of attributes K. If in the where clause we have an equation a is equal to b and b is an attribute that we already know is uniquely determined by the output, so b is already in k, then also a must be uniquely determined, so also a will be added to k. The fourth clause says that if our set of attributes contains a key of some tuple variable x, then we add all the attributes of x to k. So the reasoning is that if k contains a key of x, then it uniquely determines the row of x, so it uniquely determines all of the attributes of x. So we can add all of them to k. 
and we repeat the steps two, three, and four until k is stable. So until we cannot add anything anymore. When k is stable, we stop and we check the following condition. We check whether k contains a key of every tuple variable that is listed under from. So k is the set of attributes that are uniquely determined by the output row. If k contains a key of every tuple variable that is listed under from, then k determines uniquely the row of each of the tables that are queried under from. So then we have a unique combination of input tables that has led to this output. And that's exactly what we want. Then the distinct is superfluous. So let's look at an example and see this algorithm in action. We want to apply this algorithm to the query on the top. For simplicity, we assume that the first and the last name together form a key for the student's table. We start with a set of attributes that is uniquely determined by the output. So we start with all the attributes that are listed in the select clause. Now we are looking for other attributes that are uniquely determined by the where clause or by the attributes that are already in K. In the where clause, we have an equation that R dot category needs to be equal to the constant homework. So homework is a constant, so R dot category is uniquely determined. So we can add R dot category to K. Next, K contains a key of the student table. It contains the first and the last name of the student. Since the first and the last name are uniquely determined by the output, and the first and the last name are a key of the student's table, and the key determines all the attributes in the table, we can add all other attributes of the student's table to K. So all other attributes of S we can add to K. So we can add s.sit and s.address. Now k contains s.sit and in the where clause we have an equation that says r.sit is equal to s.sit. s.sit is uniquely determined by the output and it must be equal to r.sit. So also r.sit is uniquely determined by the output. So we add it to k. Now we cannot add anything anymore to k. So now we check whether our set k contains a key of each of the tuple variables listed under from. So we've already said that k contains a key of s, namely s.first and s.last. Does k also contain a key of r? So our results, the key of the results consists of the student ID, the category, and the number. We have r.sit, we have the student ID, we have r.category in k, and we have r.number in k. So indeed, k contains a key of each of the tuple vari variables under from. So the condition is fulfilled. Thus, we can conclude that the distinct is superfluous. So we can remove the distinct and we will have the same result. If first and last is not a key of the student's table, then the conclusion will be different, and rightly so, then the distinct changes the outcome. Now we've had an introduction to the basics of SQL. Let's summarize some of the main mistakes in query formulation. One of the main mistakes we have seen is missing join conditions. And if you miss a join condition, we usually see unexpected duplicate rows in the results. Next, unnecessary joins are also a mistake. We might not see this in the result, but it might slow down our query significantly. Self joins are tricky because if we have a self join of some table with itself, so we have multiple tuple variables ranging over the same table, 
then it's very easy to forget the necessarily inequality conditions. So usually we want to express that we look at two different rows of the same table, not twice the same row. And also you have to be careful how you formulate this inequality condition. If you have a table that has a key consisting of two attributes, let's say A and B, then we look at different rows, not if A and B are different, but if A is different or B is different. So it's sufficient that one of the key attributes is different. This suffices to conclude that we look at different rows. So we have to be careful how we formulate these inequality conditions. Unexpected duplicates in the result are often a sign of a mistake. So you should take the time and try to understand why you see duplicates. And only if you understand why you see the duplicates, then possibly eliminate them using this thing. And you should also avoid using unnecessary distincts because they hide such mistakes and they may slow down your query.